Again, hi, I'm Lindsay Davis. I'm a senior intelligence analyst at CB Insights, where we research emerging market technologies and trends in uh, financial services is my specialty. But tonight we're here to talk about boards. And I know a lot of you are early stage founders and starting to figure out, you know, what does it look like to build my first board and who should be on my advisory board. And we're going to get the lenses of not only the investor, the entrepreneur, but as well as legal and people that have really been in the trenches with startups. And with that, I'm going to kick it off and let Jonathan introduce himself, and then we'll give everyone an opportunity to talk about what they do today. Uh, hey there. Uh, Jonathan Wasserstrom, co-founder and CEO of Squarefoot. Uh, Squarefoot's a new kind of commercial real estate company that provides transparent access to listings, in-house brokerage services, and a flexible space offering, uh, all for growing companies uh, like y'all will be. So if you need office space, please find us. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Peter Wang. I, uh, I'm currently CTO at, uh, at uh, The Mighty, which is a health community uh, where we connect patients and caregivers, people with health challenges together so they can help one another. Um, and I think today on the panel, I'll probably represent kind of the operator. I've been a long time operator in the New York tech scene uh, at different startups from Fire29, Buddy Media, and so on and so forth, seeing a lot of, you know, from Series A to growth round companies. Uh, my name is Isabel. Thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, I'm an investor at Lair Hippo Ventures, which is actually the, the most active early lead stage investor in New York. Prim primarily seed stage, um, so most of our checks are you know, between one to two million dollars, say, at, at the seed. Um, it typically is also around where the first formal, or the first kind of you know, investor comes on as, as part of the board, and we can talk a little bit more about what that looks like, but have some experience through that. Uh, and, and in terms of our portfolio, we actually we focus both on, on enterprise and consumer, have a really wide, diverse um, portfolio at this point with over 300 active portfolio companies. Um, so I can give a little bit of a perspective you know, as an investor coming in on a board and, and helping to, to really kind of advise the company as they grow, share a little bit about what that looks like and, and some advice from that perspective too. Awesome. Hi, I'm Salil, I'm a partner at Goodwin in the technology group. Our practice really focuses on representing uh, early stage and uh, growth as well as public companies in the technology sphere. So we are full life cycle, so incorporation all the way through exit. I spend most of my day helping founders through that journey um, from incorporating, you know, and hopefully at some point IPOing and selling. So we talk a lot about these issues about board, board construction, governance, economics, and kind of really help them and manage them through that growth cycle. So I'm going to start with you, Salil, and I'm hoping that you could give us a better detailed view into the differences between what is a board advisor, what is a board observer, and what are the functions and roles, especially when you're starting out. Yeah. Sorry to start out on some legal basics because, uh, not going to be the most exciting part of the call. But um, really, this is really to set the stage for, for kind of the conversation that we're going to have. So when you form a company, there, there's some different stakeholders. The first are the, the stockholders. They own the company, and, and they elect the board of directors. That board of directors serves at the bequest of the stockholders, and they're there for general oversight and management of the business. The board is responsible for making key decisions. For example, should we sell the company? Should we take on a great deal of debt? And more importantly, they're also responsible for, for actually hiring and managing the day-to-day -day team, the officers of the company. So when you think about the board, it really is that, that high-level oversight that they're, they're giving uh, to the actual management team who is in the trenches and working day in, day out. Right? So that's the board. And you can supplement that board with what is an advisory board. So those are people that don't necessarily have voting control in the company and don't actually have decision making, but they're there really to provide advice, feedback, um, inspiration to the management team to help them through that, that journey. But they don't necessarily have any, any control over the actual company or any decision making authority. Um, the, last kind of the last kind of player in all of this is a board observer, which you'll often hear. You'll hear investors asking for that right. And so what that is, it, it's a participant in terms of board meetings but unlike actual board members, they don't actually have any voting control. So they'll, again, participate in board meetings, they'll be part of the discussion, but they won't actually have any, any control rights or any voting rights. So it's an important feature in, in rounding out your board and, and controlling that room, but, but not one that, that actually will have a vote at the end of the day. So you mentioned a lot of different stakeholders. How many seats should we be thinking about when we're a seed or pre-seed stage company? So uh, that, that conversation really um, comes into what is, what is your goal and at what stage you are. 
So typically, you know, um, what we found is that at that early stage, the founders are just getting started. They're really working through their product, really going to market. And so the, often the smaller the board, we find it most effective because we want, the, we want the, the team to really be focused at that point uh, on actually product and actually getting their vision out and less in terms of, of control of the overall process and control of a larger board. Jonathan, I want to lob it over to you and see if you had any insights into when you decided to pick your first advisory members and how you went about making that decision. Uh, yeah, so from when we first started, we had a bunch of kind of informal advisors. Some of those guys uh, wound up investing in our angel round. Um, we actually, at no point, have really formalized an official advisory board. But we've kept these advisors around kind of every step, and then kind of every subsequent round, a bunch of the advisors who were hanging out with us Previously, usually wind up investing uh, in the round, uh, but because we wind up uh, kind of caring about a bunch of different parts of our own ecosystem, uh, we generally have these kind of conversations one off instead of like all five people that I call on a regular basis in the same room at the same time. Uh, because we've tried that and it just wasn't terribly useful for us just because of the different people. Uh, also, these are all generally very busy people, so it's hard enough to schedule one on one time with them, much less. You talk about all like the different connections that need to happen when you have six people in a room. Um, and then we actually we have a five-member board with one vacancy that we keep uh, saying we're going to hold and wait for the perfect real estate guy to come around. And we haven't, but uh, we still have, like at this point, probably like 20 of the most senior real estate people in the country that are uh, kind of investors with us. And this gets back to, we'll talk about this more later, but like how we use the board of directors versus when I have a real estate question, who do I call, and the type of questions that I leverage different people in our uh, kind of orbit for. Mm -hmm. And Isabel, from the investor's perspective, when we're thinking about building a board of directors, we've got the advisory board, but now we need to transition to be an actual board. Like, how do you go about making that decision, and how do you help companies transition into that? Sure. So, so typically at the CCH, as I alluded to before, that's the, the first time. The, the board exists at incorporation, but that's the first time where typically you're bringing in someone who's, who's outside of just the founding team. Um, and so in a, in, a, in a price seed round, typically that's, that's actually a term in the term sheet. Um, most lead seed stage investors would uh, tend to, to ask for board rights, and so they would they'd be looking to come in as an advisor, as part of the board, and also as for them as, as a protection, protection in some sense as well for their investment. Um, typically what, what a board looks like at that stage is there tends to be two um, seats that are reserved for the common shares. Typically those are, are the two founders. Um, or if, and we can talk about, this, this actually came up in, in conversation beforehand, if it's, if it's one founder, typically it's a founder and then maybe an, an independent um, that's coming in to kind of represent the interests of the common shareholders. And then typically there's one preferred share uh, board seat as well that tends to be filled by the investor um, because most typically that, you know, they would have preferred shares through, through that investment. Mm -hmm. Peter, you've seen a bunch of different companies in different stages. What makes a really good board advisor? Very good question. I think it goes back to your point about the stage of the company you're in, and I think as well as the what are your goals, what are your challenges. And the ones I've seen most successful, I think there is a bit of diversity definitely in there because it is true that the more different perspectives that they can share from their point of view and the, the better they can articulate it, uh, and also it does take a, a more seasoned I've founder in some ways because that person, when you have a very diverse board, needs to coordinate and actually bring everyone uh, you know, to the table. Um, but the ones that, where the founder is also much more clear about what they want to achieve and be very articulated and bring the right expertise to the table, those ones I've seen uh, the most helpful. I've also been on the other side as an advisor before. I think those, the ones I find most productive are where they come with very specific questions and keep us posted uh, along the way, not just on, you know, once every three months when you don't have the context anymore. So I've had this question personally. If you are an early stage company and you are going into your board of directors meeting, what should I be prepared to address in the meeting? Should I be sending out, you know, my deck in advance? Should I be preparing a memo? And I think that there's a bunch of varied opinions, but Peter Fenton has said on the 20 Minute VC, you know, it's great to do work 
ahead of the meeting because you want to be able to be prepared and to be thoughtful and to be present rather than you know going through a 10 page slide deck that doesn't have any value and any of you can start with that but tell me Jonathan from your perspective how do you prepare for your board like how do you get them up to speed with what's going on and has that evolved over the life cycle of your company uh, it'd be nice if all the people in the boardroom read the board deck before I always, I always read <laughs> the materials. Thing. Uh, as far as what we do to prepare uh, there's usually like anywhere depending on what we're going through uh, like a 15 to 20 page slide deck uh, that's generally pretty standardized. There's a whole bunch of like operating metrics, business metrics, financial metrics. Uh, that's the stuff that we like to not spend too much time like discussing at the board meeting. That's the stuff that hopefully everybody's looked at in advance and then if we need to dive in on anything. Um, and then we usually try to have, again, depending on what's going on, uh, kind of one to two or three kind of meaty topics as we'll call them, which where we have kind of the brain trust all assembled a few times a year. Uh, where we can get everybody's viewpoints on it and uh, hopefully make some, make some kind of strategic progress uh, forward. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've, I'll say this, I've, uh, maybe you guys have been in, in very long board meetings before, you know, say as you have an hour and a half locked out, you've spent three hours there, and it's true, the more prep, the better, but it's also actually hard for us operators as well to prepare, I say a week ahead of time, send the deck out four days before, and also, a lot of times what we try to do is actually having independent conversations ahead of time with individual board members. And, and I'll point out the reason why. Every board member, unless you have an amazingly homogeneous board, has different perspectives, different motivations, different expertise, different points of view. And I think for somebody to be productive, you kind of want to suss out what are they thinking about already? What are the things they want to raise? So no one's throwing a grenade you know, in the middle of the meeting and you're like, oh man, I wish you and I talked about this beforehand. So there's a lot of prep that we try to do ahead of time uh, in the ideal case. Um, and then in the meeting, I often find there's only about two big topics you can really go through at any given board meeting, no matter how much we try to prepare and so on, uh, because they often take a lot longer to debate, whether it's like, do we focus on retention? Are we actually have product market fit? Those sometimes draw out uh, a lot longer than anticipate. Isabel, how do you like to prep for board meetings? Yeah, so so I I would very much agree that you kind of get get out what you put in, and that if you can share the information ahead of time, if you can allow for everyone to have gone through the preliminary materials, the financials, the KPIs, um, maybe even some some preliminary kind of uh, groundwork for a strategic conversation, those can be incredibly valuable conversations. Um, I do think what's really important is is having a very clear sense of, I, th I think, taking a step back, I think you know, board meetings in general are also a very, a very helpful means of creating alignment and driving accountability across your, your very core group of both the executive team but also the advisors that you have around the table. Um, and, and so I think the key thing, especially for those strategic conversations, is making sure mm -hmm. that you have a really clear sense of and, and make sure that you, through the conversation you drive to what are some of the key action items here and that you, you can f create some boundaries for that conversation. Um, and, but, but if done well, I think it can be an incredibly helpful, uh, helpful kind of medium to, to dive into some of those topics that just day to day may be incredibly important, but, but it's hard to, to carve out the time to, to talk through. Um, the other aspect of the board, so there's on the, on along the lines of accountability and, and alignment, there's of course the you know, voting matters that are gone through during the board meeting as well. But then there's, there's also an optional kind of executive session that, that can sometimes happen. And those, you know, for especially a, um, a, a CEO or, or co-founder, that can be a very lonely role, right? Um, it can be a role where, where it's often hard to, to seek out feedback or get a second opinion about the way that you're, you're doing your role day to day. And if done correctly, if you, if you really trust your board members, if you've brought on someone that you, that you respect, that you believe is, is really aligned with your vision for the company, um, a board can also be a really helpful sounding board for you individually. Um, and to talk through a little bit how you're, how you're leading the company, some of the decisions that you're making, how decisions are being made, um, and to be a, a confidential but I think helpful sounding board through that. Um, so that's another aspect that, uh, again, if used correctly can be, I think, quite powerful. I don't know if that's if you agree, agree from the from the CEO perspective, yeah. but um, but certainly as an as an investor, I think that's a, a core component of it as well. Yeah, I mean, let's think about what it's not, right? Basically, what 
you know, everyone has said, right? It's not just an open discussion, right? You should not assume that you're just going to walk into a board meeting and the board is just going to discuss. It is much more a presentation first and then a, a you know, a led discussion with, you know, again, hopefully goals at the end of it. We're going to lead a discussion around product and it's to decide whether this is a product line we want to go down or it's this product line. Yep. We need to make some staffing changes. Do we think this is the right type of candidate, you know, to fill this type of role or that type of candidate, right? So, so I think, you know, just to, to kind of think about what we always tell our, our especially our first-time founders going to the first-time board meeting is, is, you know, it's not a conversation. Prepare for it. Make sure you have an update piece and, and uh, you know, a conversation piece, as, as these guys have said, and then use that, use that kind of executive session for, for a more honest dialogue. And part of that just from a, which is sometimes a little more of a legal point, but, but you'll, you're going to have more people in the boardroom than just the board members, right? So often in a board, and, and especially as you get a little more mature as a company, you'll have, you know, your, your department heads that, that can give updates on product, on marketing, on sales, on the different, you know, kind of core facets of your business. Then during that executive session is, you know, you will have all those people, including board observers, typically leave so the board can discuss, you know, items either that, that are important and, and you want to make sure that there's attorney con client confidentiality or that, that, you know, for the founder to get that feedback. So just thinking of board structure, I think is important to kind of lay out for what all these people have said, which I think I totally agree with. And those are the best, most effective board meetings we've been in. Mm -hmm. One of the questions we got was about how do you compensate your board? And do you think about equity in the early days? And you've got an opinion on this. I'm going to start with you and then we can get the founder's perspective on, you know, how did you guys think about compensating them personally? You know, it's a, it's a privilege to be on the startups board. Like, you're lucky. <laughs> That's, that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think at some level it's a little bit of an easy question, especially at the early days, because the people on the board are typically going to be your founding, your founding team, and then often your lead investor. If you have a three-person board, yeah. people are doing that because they have a vested stake, so you're not compensating your, you know, your, your VC investor or your investor representative on top of whatever their investment is. And you as founders, you know, you have your founder's stake, you're getting your salary, so, so you're part of the board. So there's often not compensation outside of, of that, uh, you know, out, outside of that. Now, it's when you bring on an independent, you'll, you know, most companies that we work with will often incentivize those independent board members through, through equity grants through the stock option plan. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, how did you think about compensating your first? We have bagels at every meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I don't eat carbs. Uh, we've actually run into that issue, too. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're the kind of the founders and the investors, we don't get anything. Uh, and since we've had a formal board once we took on our seed capital, we've had an institutional, uh, sorry, an independent uh, board member. And, Can you double click on that and explain the difference? Oh, I thought it, uh, an independent board member is somebody who is not an investor in the company. Uh, I guess they can be, uh, but they're not like the lead investor. Like, as well as mentioning, like Lyra comes and they write you a nice term sheet, and then you accept from them, and she gets one of your board seats. Uh, she would be an investor. She obviously has a whole bunch of money in your company, and you could get somebody else who has somewhere between zero and a little money in the company, um, but is not, um, I guess, from a I'm not an attorney. There's one of those up here, but is not kind of fiduci has different fiduciary duties than the investors do, because the investor has. Fiduciary duties to their LPs. Well, the, oh, the board of directors, all it's the directors okay, have okay. fiduciary duties. They have a duties to the stockholders as a whole. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea of an independent, I think, is that they they're not otherwise affiliated with an investor, right? So 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 they may be someone from industry that that, that can be valuable. So yeah, yeah. potentially that person is from the real estate industry. If you're in direct to consumer, maybe it's someone that that, that lives in in the fashion or apparel industry. So so they're often an, kind of an outsider that's not affiliated with an investor or the management team that's come in to, 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 to really round out the board and, and provide a real outsider's view. What they he would says. typically be an observer? Yeah. <laughs> they would be an observer or they would be an advisor? Uh, so this is a great question because they can fit any of those roles, right? So, so often, depending on the structure of the board, as you mature, they will all provide balance on the board between the investors and then the founders. So if you have a five-person board, maybe it's two investors, two of the founding team, and then one independent. They're kind of, in some ways, a tiebreaker. Um, and so they could actually be on the board and have voting rights. They could also just be an advisor. So just to provide, you know, their input and their guidance to the board so they can wear either roles depending on, on how involved you want them to be. 
in the life cycle of com every company is different, right? If I'm a B2B business, I'm a little bit longer term. If I'm a B2C business, I might be growing like a weed. What is the duration of my board members and how do I think about structuring the timelines and is it around fundraising or is it around, you know, growth? So typically, you know, the board seats, when an investor comes in, they're contractually granted to that, to, to that investor. So for as long as they hold, you know, largely the, some portion of their stake, they will always be able to designate one board seat. Um, observer rights are similar. Some people won't, won't negotiate for board seats, but the, they will negotiate for an observer right just to have a presence in the room. And so those, you know, will be for as long as the conditions on that board seat are met. Typically, you know, they are there for as long as that investor holds, holds their stock. Um, what we often see is that early stage investors will join a board, they want to be there through those A up to the B round, and they'll often voluntarily step off the board to make room then for the next set of investors who will then lead the company through their growth stage and through their, their more mature stage. Um, so different funds have different opinions of that. We definitely have people who come on at seed and stay all the way through. Um, but but that, that's how you think about it. And you, you want to have that conversation a little bit up front, but, it, but it'll definitely evolve from financing round to financing round. We definitely see a lot of variation there. I mean, it's, it's ultimately based on whether or not we believe that we can really bring to bear kind of a, a, a very helpful um, perspective and, and suite of resources for that specific founder. Of course, we work very closely with all founders that, that we invest in, regardless of whether or not we're, we have a seat on the board. Um, but if, if we think that kind of filling that seat will continue to add a lot of value, and if the founder, frankly, is, is also <laughs> seeking some of that, um, we, it's not uncommon for us to at least be an observer in the room or, or kind of participate in, in some more formal way uh, on an ongoing basis. But, but it really is kind of a case-by-case -case for us um, and very much a, a mutual decision that, that's come to between the, the founder and, and you know, the investor. How many solo founders are in the room? Okay, cool, quite a few. So this next question I'm gonna take from the Fire Tablet, and it's about how do we deal with disagreements at the board level? And what are the differences if I'm a solo founder versus a co-founder or maybe even a three co-founding team structure? We'll start with you and then talk about maybe from the company's perspective, how you've dealt with it if you've had any turmoil. Yeah, I, so, um... I think what happens on the early stage is that a lot of the conversations happen both at the board meetings and through the board meetings. So how we, you know, how we kind of advise our founders is, again, do your board prep, make sure you're helping, you know, make sure you're moving into those meetings with some understanding, you know, of the topics you want to cover, of the decisions you want to, you know, you want to achieve. And, and when disagreements occur, I think, you know, rarely I think have we worked through them where it tends to be like a you know, a two-one vote where, where, let's say, the investor director votes opposite, right? There, there's, you really want to try in those early stages, especially, get consensus around the table because you're kind of moving through trouble if, if not all your stakeholders are kind of moving in the same direction. You know, it doesn't always happen, but that's typically how we see it. The, the only other thing I'll mention is that investors will often uh, negotiate for certain blocking rights. So even if you, you know, uh, the founding team, or, or even if it's a solo founder that has the right to designate two seats, controls the board, right? So in a three board structure, you, you know, you, two of three votes will always win. Um, there are certain matters that the investors will say, hey, if you do things that are fairly extraordinary, we want a right to block that, and you will need our consent as, as, as one of those two, you know, uh, one of those two votes. Um, and those are things like debt financings, related party transactions, so that, you know, um, that if you're going to hire a family member to do something, that they want to have some control over that. Some major expenditures of capital, if you're going to go spend well beyond the budget, then they're going to want some control over that. So, so, so that's the way we work through that on kind of the board level. But going back to the independent seat, I think yep. for, for a solo founder, that's where an independent can be really helpful, yep. right? Is you'll, you'll have someone coming in from, from the preferred perspective, uh, you'll have your seat you know, for, on the common side as a founder, but then there's this open seat that you can fill with someone who um, is both a, a great advisor for you, but that also has um, perhaps kind of shared interests in, in some way. I think it's, it's worth stressing, though, that regardless, there's a little bit of a dance in terms of, of voting rights and, and balancing out, say, investors with, with independent or, or, or founder um, seats. Everyone, though, does have a fiduciary responsibility to the business. And so 
ultimately those interests are aligned. Um, it's, you want to be thoughtful about the, the people who are going to be helping to craft your, 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 the direction of the business, and, and that's a weighty decision. But, but I do think you talk, you'll talk, I think, hear a lot about some of those dynamics and being really thoughtful about them. And I do want to just stress that from an investor perspective, you, you do have, have that legal responsibility um, that, that very much holds true. Have, oh, have, have you I was dealt with say, it differently? Yeah, I think what's interesting, uh, disagreements or friction, a lot of times happen, well, there's all different topics too. The ones I've definitely experienced are, say, the strategic direction of the company and whether or not how much of a round next financing should bring us. What should we be investing in? Uh, sometimes whether or not this should be a debt round or equity round. Uh, and and, the, and it's on, the, on the product side, as an operator, we do have a lot of debates around what do we invest in? What's the most important metric we're looking at? I do find a lot of these disagreements happen not at the board meeting itself, but actually outside the board meeting, uh, independent calls, where you can actually share your screen, pull a few things, and talk through some of the details, and get a bi-directional understanding of where I'm coming from, where you're coming from, and you kind of go through Ron Robin a little bit, each one of them, to really get a sense. And then you present that together. Say, last time we had, you know, that was a topic, we talked offline, here's, you know, after talking to you guys offline, here's what we come up so far, what do you guys think? That kind of formalizes the decision, those I've seen quite often, from, you know, from series C, you know, seed all the way up. And some of this comes down to picking the right investors in your company, and maybe, Jonathan, you can speak about how you had to level up your board of directors, perhaps? Uh, how do you level it up? Yes, as you've transitioned and grown. Um, so the boardroom's gotten a lot bigger, even mm -hmm. if the board hasn't. Uh, so we still have, we had a board meeting yesterday, actually, and the guy who led our seed round, uh, who doesn't have a formal seat anymore, was in the room. Uh, one of two of the investors from, we did a kind of a seed two round, um, two of the investors from, <clears throat> excuse me, that round uh, were in the room, and then um, one guy who's been investing and kind of been the largest check every time in, and then finally said, well, I, I think we have enough money and I think I'd like a board seat, which happened at uh, the last round. Uh, he's in the room, and then the guy who led our A is in the room. Uh, and then we also have our independent director. Uh, so of all those people, there's actually only four board members, including myself. Um, and so you level up, hopefully your, your C investor from a quality perspective is no worse than your A investor. So level up is an interesting phrase to use there. Uh, you just have um, kind of with the subsequent financing rounds, especially as the checks get larger and larger, uh, the people writing those checks want a seat at the table. Um, so the room just can start getting crowded. Uh, and then you try and whittle the room back to a more manageable <laughs> size, which we're hopefully in the process of doing. When we first started the seed round, uh, we had six meetings a year. Um, probably should have had even more. This is my first time building a company. Uh, and the reason, rationale for having uh, kind of six times a year was uh, we were just getting started and uh, we were actually looking to the board for a lot of help uh, and a lot of things. So more frequent check-ins was actually uh, very useful for us. Uh, as we've matured as a uh, leadership team and as a company, uh, we now have quarterly board meetings, uh, which seem to be the right cadence to get everybody in the room at the same time. As Peter was saying, like, that's not the only time I'm talking to my board members. If that's the case, then we have a very big problem at the board <laughs> meeting, because uh, they have no idea what's happened in the last three months. Three months is actually a very long time uh, in startup life. Um, so we're talking to the board members kind of and the other people in the room kind of consistently throughout that three months, and then a really deep dive which with everybody who's gonna be in the room in the week leading up to the board meeting, so there's no surprises, uh, in good ways or bad ways, uh, and you've kind of already had the fights and the in-depth discussions, uh, more of the latter generally than the former, uh, mm -hmm. uh, are happening before you're in the room uh, live fire. How did you hire your first board members? So except for independent, um, everybody else is an investor, so we hired them through the financing process. They, I guess, paid us to be board members, which is nice. Uh, with the independent, uh, we really kind of lucked out. We met him uh, through one of our investors, which is generally not supposed to do because um, if what well, the goal is this independent person, as the first word says, it's to be independent, and you don't want like one of your investors, like best friends, to be that independent, as in the times when there is a kind of 
two versus one vote or three versus two vote, depending on, on uh, the size of the board. Uh, you want somebody who's truly independent, not kind of, oh, this guy you know, did me a favor and now I'm gonna do him a favor and you're the one who's on the other side of that favor being done. Um, so, but we got really lucky. Uh, they had known each other, but they never worked together. So there was none of that uh, kind of even concern of this kind of quid pro quo. Um, and we got really lucky. He was the first person we had met. And before we had met him, we kind of laid out like, what does the ideal independent board member look like? And we wrote it down and then Jesse, uh, who wound up being it, was it. So when we sat with him, we were like, okay, this looks good, we should do this. And then you like start talking to yourself, well, can you like get married to the first person you meet? Mm -hmm. and you're like, well, that's probably not a good idea. But then you, the second line of thinking was, well, we can spend the next three months looking for somebody who looks just like Jesse, or we can just pick Jesse now. And we picked Jesse then, and that's five years ago, and it's been great. Oh, well. Can you fire a board member, Salil? So typically you can't fire a board member, right? So there's under law reasons that for cause you can remove a board member, but, but again, typically they are, you know, the, the board is elected by the, by the uh, stockholders and often in what's called a voting agreement, you have pre-agreed pre to vote your stock in order to vote certain people or, or based on the designation of certain individuals. So there's generally not an ability to kind of remove a board member if you feel like they're no longer, you know, uh, uh, no longer a part of the team or if there's a disagreement. But you can remove the founder. Again, it, it depends on, on what's been prescribed. The room's so, getting uncomfortable. Yeah. So, <laughs> double-clicking. So, I, I, so the typical board construct, let's talk about a three-person board, right, for early stage companies. The common shareholders get to elect the two common seats. Typically, in a founding team, you know, if you're a solo founder, you're probably the only one with common stock. So the only way you're going to kick yourself off the board is if you vote yourself off. If you and, you know, you and another founder have equal holdings, then the only way you know, you're going to kick either of you off is that if both of you agree to get 50-50, you know, to get to you know, a majority, you need both of you to agree, right? So, so there's not a lot of concern, I think, in the early stage of, of whether you'll be there or not. There, you know, as the board matures, or in some cases, if the investors take over control of the board, um, which happens you know, through the later stages, then you as a, as a founder who has a designation at that point, maybe just as a CEO of the company, you're the CEO representative on the board, there's a potential that, that you could lose your both CEO title as well as, as that board seat, right? Um, but in the early days, it's not something we're, we're really stressed about. And I think from an investor standpoint, what most of them will tell you is that they're betting an idea, they're betting on you in order to execute that idea. And so, the company probably isn't there you know, in those early stage days if you're not there. So, so I, I think it's not something that we tend to focus on both because contractually you, you probably can't get kicked off and, and you know, I think the investors aren't, aren't there to kind of do a hostile takeover after a seed round, right? So, 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 so I think it's, you're pretty safe off. Yeah. I turned this off so we didn't get any feedback there. Um, just, just to stress that point, I mean, for, for a seed investor, the it is an investment in the team. That's that's why we make we make that investment. Um, and and so I think that you know, for us, we spend a lot more time thinking about how do we keep a founding team mm -hmm. in the business um, because we believe in them, and a lot less time thinking about kind of like what what that looks like um, in terms of a, a founder stepping off the board. Peter, you talked about dealing with conflict outside of the board. What is the most confrontational thing that you've seen working across different stages? Oh wow. It was a question from the tablet. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who asked that question? Not, uh, not directed at you, but using yeah. your experience here. Let me see. Wow, what is the biggest thing? Well, I think what's interesting about those conflicts, uh, and I think, back to your point about when the room gets bigger, uh, there are definitely a lot more dissenting ideas about where we can go. And also when the opportunity gets bigger, the stake, the stake gets higher, and therefore attention gets higher at the same time. And when the, future, when the future of the company can take different directions, and the decision we're making, you know, doing those financing rounds, either take us to a very high expectation after the round, and some of the board members will be uncomfortable, especially early stage ones, to take that risk to say, maybe that's too much risk. Maybe what we should do is raise a smaller round, set the expectation to be lower, and chug along versus setting a very much bigger expectation. 
And depending on their confidence in the team, depending on the traction that we, you know, we had, that can be very contentious because the future, no one has a, a clear crystal ball of what the future can be. And when we start discussing, a lot of the assumptions start coming out. Why do you think we're not, are you saying we're not going to succeed in five, 10 years with this, this goal? And I think those, you know, I think that's particular scenario. We, you know, we took a bigger risk in that case because we believe the opportunity is big enough to take the big risk. Um, but I can easily see the other direction as well. We took a smaller round. I think what's interesting about those scenarios is that there wasn't any decision that could have been wrong. But those contentions points really speaks to people's motivation, um, their investing philosophy, and their, their appetite for risk. And as you know, just being an operator, kind of managing that, because we, our, all our eggs are in the basket as well. Uh, and we, it's also very contentious for us, very emotional for us to decide whether or not this is the right step. Anyways, I think that hopefully that gives you a, a glimpse uh, in those moments when you try to decide what the future company could be uh, are often, uh, I guess, challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has there been any discussion around valuations? Now, valuations, especially in yeah. fintech, the area that I cover, are, are getting pretty high. Does that typically get discussed at the board? And is there any type of negotiations around, you know, what do we think is too risky when you talk about risk? when we hit yeah. those targets, like those, those valuations are tied to KPIs and metrics. And if we're being super ambitious, like how do you as a board member or an advisor, how should you be thinking about that and advising a startup? And as a startup founder, how should I be thinking about my board? If anyone wants to take that. But I'll say one, I'll just say, I'll continue. I think that's a great question. I think every time we talk about valuation, I've always felt uncomfortable. This is being very honest. Yeah. Because on one hand, you want to be highly valued um, as a company, as a team, as a prospect. Uh, on the other hand, you do wonder, uh, do I have a 50-50 chance of hitting it? Is it 70-30? Is it 60-40? And how much room are we giving ourselves between now and then? And a lot of times, as transparent as you want to be, I'll say this, sometimes there's a lot of reflection we have to do uh, on how honest are we with ourselves, with what we could do. And that takes a lot of self-awareness and also I think the senior team, executive team actually, also the board, often debate about them um, as well. Um, but the ones that I've been through We've always chosen, most of the time, chosen a, a number that we're not comfortable with, but we say we can probably hit a 50 50 chance of getting there. Kind of like an OKR in a way. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, I'll just pause there. I think that's, but it's definitely always comes up every two years or less. <laughs> yes. Yeah, every two years is pretty good then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so don't worry about it. Yeah. Isabel, has this topic come up in your board meetings? Yeah, definitely. So, so I think. I mean, one, I guess just to, to talk about valuations very quickly, kind of in, in broad terms, um, I, th I think it's, it's easy to think that like, an, a high valuation is just always a good thing. Um, it, it's valuing your business. It's, it's valuing the opportunity of the business. Um, and, and, and there certainly is, there's enough capital in the market right now to sustain that in some ways. It's a very competitive capital market today. Yep. So there are quite high valuations. I think that what you need to be thinking about it as an investor is um, is kind of what to to the earlier point. What do you need to prove out in order for in order for the business to really be worth that? And specifically to maybe bring it back to more t more tangible kind of terms. What do you need to do between now and the next round? Um, and what are value what do valuations typically look like for a company like yours at that next round? Mm -hmm. And and I think what the challenge is is that often, and, and today given the valuations are quite healthy, the, the delta, the difference between kind of what those valuations look like at the next round and the valuations that you may see today for, a very, for an overvalued business could actually be quite small. And so what that, what that means is that there's, there's a, you know, still the KPIs that you need to hit between, say, like a Series B and a Series C, um, but, but, there's, but there's greater oper operational risk essentially to the business because you have, you don't have buffer really to get there. You don't have a lot of room to grow into that valuation. Um, 
And, and so you have to essentially assume that you're going to continue to be overvalued at the next round or that you're going to hit every single kind of like operational KPI perfectly on schedule between now and then in order to sustain that. Um, and that, you know, for, for an early stage business that's inherently risky anyway, um, it's, it's incremental risk that you're adding to the business. And so yeah. we definitely think about it. Um, and and not, only, not only actually kind of you know, for the business itself, but also how the capital markets will change over time and, and whether or not companies will be valued in the same way kind of when, when you next go out to raise. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that's, that's top of mind for us. I think it's a healthy conversation to have. It is definitively a challenging conversation to have, though. You made, um, I was going to say you make yeah, a very good point about the stages you're in, because the ones I actually find easier to talk about is when your revenue line or growth projection is you have enough traction to project. Uh, let's, say, let's say you have the same revenue stream as last round, and this round is just about pouring gas on top mm -hmm. of that. That is much easier valuation conversation to have. The ones that we find the most difficult is that you all have one revenue stream, you're exploring the second revenue stream, you have some traction, but not enough momentum to say this is the percentage of rate of growth over the next 18 months. So therefore, you're making a lot of assumptions in there. Therefore, there's the uncomfortableness. Yep. There's how, how much can I bet on it? And also, the investment conversation comes in. Are you reallocating some of the resources that you put into revenue stream A into revenue stream B mm -hmm. to make that happen. And that's when the independent conversation needs to happen because maybe certain board members that say, you gotta go all in on the second revenue stream because that is your future. Some of them say, that's too risky. Are you kidding me? Can you at least say 50-50? And then you can't really have that board meeting out in the right. open. You gotta talk independently. And, and the reality is, I mean, at the, at the seed stage, certainly, you don't have data to create like well-banked assumptions about how your, your revenue is gonna change over time and what, what some of those kind of growth mechanics look like. Um, so for us, it's a lot of that art versus yeah. science. It becomes much easier to, to understand the valuation of your business and how that'll scale over time as you mature and just as there's more information about how your business scales. Um, but I'd say that that's, that's one value of having a, an institutional investor on the board is that they have a, you know, a, a wide, a large sample size in terms of different types of businesses and, and typically what they're valued at at different stages. And so they'll, they'll be able to bring some of that historical data um, to inform some of the decisions that you're making as a board. Yep. Jonathan, for someone that's pioneering a new market where you don't have any data, how do you balance, how do you strike the balance between raising enough funding and managing expectations? And do you have any advice on that? Um. Raise as much as you can and set expectations properly. Uh, I'm probably not a typical CEO or founder when I say this, but uh, this is always going to be used against me in negotiations, but I'm not terribly dilution sensitive. Uh, I'm optimizing for the one, right? Uh, which is, I'm building one, this is one of the things Peter said, like, I have one company, I don't have 30 companies, so I'm optimizing for the chance that that one turns into a one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it means you're not optimizing for valuation, uh, you're optimizing for the chance of getting to that one, right? So you're picking the investors, not necessarily who gives you the highest number on a term sheet, because there's a whole bunch of things that matter a whole hell of a lot more than what that top line number is. Like what we've been talking about for the last, whatever, 45 minutes is these board conversations and how you're getting strategic value from your board. Uh, we haven't talked once about dollars and cents until now. If you have a crappy board, doesn't matter how much money you think your company is worth, you're not going to be successful. And I've seen a bunch of examples of that kind of playing out. Um, everybody reads like the big TechCrunch articles about these valuations of a trillion dollars. Um, and then everybody gets super excited, okay, I want to raise a billion dollars at a trillion dollar valuation. Uh, but that's really kind of the wrong thing. First off, if that's what you're in here for, that's probably not good. Uh, and secondly, you're kind of optimizing for the wrong thing. That's, yeah. That's what I'd say for all that. Oh, and then set expectations properly. Uh, it comes to everything, right? Uh, especially it comes to like board um, conversations. Um, even like our best board members, if you and they are being honest, they're not thinking about your business all the time. I'm thinking about my business all the time like too much. I wish I could think about it less because it's not healthy. Uh, your board member thinks about it surely quarterly at the board meeting and then a week before when you send the deck and then for the hour in between the two and then kind of the periodic check-ins but then he or she gets back to the other 30 boards or other 10 boards that they're involved with and the 10 new investments they're doing. 
which doesn't mean they're not really good board members. It means that they're thinking about 25 other things other than your company, and you're thinking about just your company, uh, which means that you have to get in this habit of setting realistic kind of stretch expectations, hopefully, because if you don't set stretch expectations, then you're not gonna do anything, but they have to be uh, realistic so that you can hit them, and then you get into this really nice cadence of saying, okay, we're gonna get from A to B, and then you get to B, and you go, okay, we're gonna get from B to C, and you get to C, and uh, you start building up this kind of real trust with your board that says, I'm gonna do this, and then you do it, and then you remind them that you did it, because again, they're not gonna remember that you told them what you're gonna do. Um, not in any like disingenuous way, and not that they don't care, but they just have a whole bunch of things that they're thinking about other than you every day, and all you're thinking about as a selfish founder is yourself. I think the, just to chime in there, I think the other, the other key touch point there is holding your board accountable for how they can add value to you outside of the board conversation as well. Um, we, you, it, it's, first you should always take, take minutes, always make sure that there's kind of a record of, of that conversation. Um, but I think it's, it's also really crucial that you're, that you're holding the members that are kind of, a, or the individuals who are around the table um, accountable to take action and 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 really add value for you in between those those board meetings, um, and I think the the board conversation is an excellent way of making sure that there's one. I think you know, you're getting investors together. I think there's some social proof that's kind of at play here, but um, but it's also a great opportunity for you to really kind of like come back to how they can be helpful for you through an introduction um, or you know some some market research work or whatever it is. But um, but it, but a good kind of like. Thing to, to make sure that you're really yeah, kind of encouraging through those conversations too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really important when you just think about who your board members are and picking them, right? I'm actually going to uh, parrot something that there is about one of your colleagues said on uh, another panel that I was on with her, and, and she said, we encourage people to talk to you know, our portfolio companies, not the ones that are superstars, but the ones that, that actually didn't do well, that, that when we were in the trenches, mm -hmm. how we as board members behaved when things you know weren't just go moving up and to the right, because I think that's a real test of of what your you know what your board members will bring to the table, right? Because when everything's going up to the right, it's really easy when revenue is going well, when product is going well, right? It's really hard when when you hit those hiccups, and, and I thought that was really great advice, and then I, so I'll echo it here and not you know but not take credit for it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is a really good question, and there's a lot of opinions on this one, and I think I know where you stand on this, but how valuable is a boutique name in a venture round? And does that mean anything to you as a board member? Isabel, first. Like, boutique. If, if another, if this, if, you know, prestigious name is investing in the company, like, are you excited about that? And I think that that's the wrong impression that we should be sending off, right? Like, you want somebody that's gonna add value, not because of the name or the, the brand equity that they bring to the table. Oh, I see. For, for an investor, yeah. how important should the, should the, the brand of the investor. firm be? Yeah. Okay, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, so, so it, it is an individual kind of decision. Um, I think you should get to know, one, you really probe, talk to, to founders that, um, that the investor has, has invested in previously or the firm has invested in previously, get a sense of, of not just maybe the, the, the brand name, but also how they operate on a day-to-day figure out if, they're, if they really are available, um, if, they, if they can be held accountable, and, um, and also you know, think a little bit about for your specific business, for your industry, you know, are, are they the right fit for you? Um, and then I think that the second order is, is to get to know that person on an individual basis. You'll be spending a lot of time with them. Um, you'll be entrusting them um, to some extent with, with your business and there's the success there. And, um, and, and I think it's, you know, that, that very much can come down to a, a personal working relationship and, and how you get along as individuals in addition to uh, the resources that they can bring to bear through their, through their firm as well. I don't know if that answered the question specifically, but okay. This is a little bit more technical. What are common stock options or compensation structures for your board and independent advisors, not investors? That's a broad question. Uh, uh, sorry, I, sorry, I'm happy to take it. You know, it really depends on the stage and, and the level, right? Um, it, it, there, you know, I don't know that, that there is any real, you know, science here because it depends on who that person is, what value, what value they're bringing. Are they coming in as advisor? Are they coming on, um, you know, a, 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 as an actual board member? How much are you going to ask of them? Um, I think, you know, I, what I always tell people is if you were to pay for those services in cash, 
what would you pay for it, and then what's the value of that stock you're getting, right? Because the other way to think about it is, hey, I have this really great advisor, they're very senior in this industry, and their time is worth X number of dollars an hour, and all I'm getting is one, you know, one hour a month. You could go raise money, potentially, from an outside investor and just pay the cash, right? So, so I think there's more of an incentive with the stock options, but I think, I think those kind of ranges are, are hard to describe because I don't know that they, they exist. I think it's very specific to the role and the individual. Yeah. If you were seeking out advice on this topic as a you know, pre-seed company, who should you reach out to first? Like, should you be Googling this? Should you be looking for advisors in the market? How do I go get smart on this topic? Uh, you can call your lawyer. That was an easy plug. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, I, I think you, you, you ask people in your, you know, in your network. I think we, we as lawyers do this. We don't help pick board members, right? But, but we certainly will help you think about what does board construction look like? What, you know, if we have market intel on, on either a firm or an individual, happy to share that. But a lot of it is, is helping you navigate the day to day. And I think the best place to do it is to talk to founders. Right, I, I tell all my founders, go talk to other founders. They're, they're going to know the best because they're in the rooms. They're on the other side of the calls um, on a day-to-day -day basis. In communities like AWS, this is a good <laughs> people, of course. Um, you know, we've got a couple minutes left, so to get through all of everyone's ability to close this out, I wanted to just ask you all, you know, what are the top two ways a founder can build and leverage a board effectively so it becomes an incredible source of value add? Know what you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very big one. And I think both as an advisor as well as you know, working with boards, that's found sometimes the hardest thing actually is asking myself, what do we need at this point of our company? And what is something that I want to ask the board, which has a specific, because they do have fiduciary responsibility, what do I ask them? Um, how do I ask them versus what I can figure out outside of the board? I think those I find constantly in my head Especially when you're in a board meeting, you know, I, I always try to figure out what do we need to ask them off. Uh, that's most valuable. The only they can provide. No, that's one, one thing that popped out of my head. Isabel? What? No, I, I think that's, I, I would echo that. Um, I, I, I think, again, you know, as I, as I mentioned at the outset, having a really clear sense of, of kind of what some of the takeaways are from the board, I think, are incredibly important as a consequence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the other, the other, aspect that I also mentioned earlier, but that I just would, would stress kind of in, in closing somewhat is, is the, the kind of feedback component too. Um, I think that's, that's an incredibly kind of powerful part of, of the board, especially in the early stages um, when, when I think it's particularly lonely for a founder. So I would say that that's, that's the other kind of characteristic or um, opportunity that I would definitely leverage. Well, and then Jonathan should close it out. Yeah, I'm actually echo something that Jonathan said earlier. I, I think, you know, it's kind of like a marriage, right? You're making a long-term bet with what is probably your most precious asset. You want someone that you like and that you want to call and that you trust with your business, right? So I think, you know, when we're looking at term sheets on behalf of a company, a lot of, you know, uh, echoing the prior question, like, like do you want to, is it the marquee brand? Is it the marquee board member? I, I always tell people it is what is that relationship going to be because, you get the best valuation, get the best brand, but, but if, if you're not going to have a good working relationship with that person, if you're not going to call them, if they're not going to be you know, influential in, in the growth with you, then they're probably not the best board member. So, so I think that's, that's a really crucial point that Jonathan made earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things Isabel said, this executive session is actually super valuable. Uh, find it, uh, and it's not just a me thing or a square foot thing, but it's actually really hard to get good feedback uh, internally because you never know if what they're saying, uh, we're not a very political organization at all, um, but you just never know if like, they're speaking truth to power or the opposite, uh, or if they don't want to say something mean because they don't want to offend you, or they're trying to, they have an ulterior motive because they don't like the person who sits next to them or any number of other things. Um, and luckily, fortunately, I've been able to build a very strong leadership team uh, who gives me the feedback, um, but still even then, like. Everybody has their own vested interest. Um, and so what I look to the board to is this executive session, uh, even without asking, they will tell me uh, where I'm messing up, which is nice. Uh, and then afterwards, I'll always text all of everybody or email after the board meeting, um, how did I do, what could I do better? And you get very frank, very honest feedback um, from them uh, in a way that you really can't get from other people. They also have their own vested interest, which I think is one thing that you just kind of have to come to 
understand and appreciate. I really like our board. I like our investors. Uh, they do have a different set of expectations, sorry, a different set of preferences ultimately than you at some point, uh, which is something that is important to recognize earlier rather than later. It doesn't turn into acrimonious relationship because of that, but it is very important to recognize that, that that's the case. Um, so yeah, the feedback. Awesome. It was a pleasure hosting this panel. Thank you.